Debs, how excited we are. All right. Welcome to the Temple of the Living God here in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida. We're happy to have you here with us. We're happy to have you here with us. Happy Father's Day. There's a lot going on in June. Happy Father's Day today to all you fathers, to all you guys who want to be fathers, to all you people who don't know you have a father. Happy Father's Day. And also, happy Juneteenth for those who celebrate. That's tomorrow. And also, happy Pride Month. A lot going on. So uh, we're glad you, ha you have time to be here. Woo, yeehaw. Well, let's have a good time. We start, the song we're starting with today is a Father's Day song. I don't have children, but I'm going to sing like I do. I don't, exact, I don't visualize that how you want to. Uh, so here, here we go. <laughs> let's do it. Brush your hair to the side, kiss you on your cheek. I want to stay up all night, making sure you breathe. Oh my God, what a gift he has given me. Yeah, I brought you into this world, and I'm sorry it's a little bit crazy. But I tell you, there's so much good, though the future looks a little bit Hazy. You see, God, me and him have a promise He'll give us everything that we need So have faith, hope, and love Faith, hope, love, repeat I want to show you the world Climb the mountain tops, watch it dance in the rain. I hope it never stops. Whatever tomorrow brings, I hope it brings you joy. And when it's all too much, I'll hold you in my arms. Yeah, I brought you into this world, and I'm sorry it's a little bit crazy but i tell you there's so much good though the future looks a little bit hazy you see god me and him have a promise he'll give us everything that we need so have faith hope love faith hope love but there will be days when you lose your faith and there will be nights when you give up hope Disappointment and pain And you flirt with the shame So you'll call me from the end of your rope And I'll give you whatever I have But there's only one thing you need And that's love I'll give you my love My love Ooh. I'll give you my love Yeah, I brought you into this world And I'm sorry it's a little bit crazy but i tell you there's so much good though the future looks a little bit hazy you see god me and him have a promise he'll give us everything that we need to have faith hope love faith hope love you gotta have faith hope love faith hope love faith hope love Repeat. Woo. Hey, thanks, y'all. Thanks. Happy Father's Day once again. Take it away. Taken from the writings of Alfred Tennyson. More things are wrought by prayer than the world dreams of. Wherefore, 
Let thy voice rise like a fountain for the night sky and the day sun. For who is better able to hear that voice which rises out into the world and beyond the world into the invisible, believing that there is a God that unites us all. This God joins us in prayer, whether we can see or feel or know it with our mind. Let us pray, always remembering more things are wrought by prayer. Unquote. Thank you. And now, if there was a for you here. Ladies and gentlemen, here are some fathers. Amanda Surratt's father, Rob Brammeister. Carmen's father, John Giannis Blex. Kimberly Cantlay's parents, Quinette and Henry J. Brent. Carolyn Chastain's father, Bill Derringer. Sandy Davis Camp's father, Robert G. Ernest. Donna Frank's father, Arthur Frank. Liz and David Dale's father, Andy Hines. Lynn Sennett's father, Captain Norman C. Himmler. Steve Isaac, with wife Donna and father Edward Charles Isaac III. Richard Kittigan's father, David Kittigan. Norv Loomis's father, Charles Joel Loomis Sr. Pat Drogan's father, Clarence Chips Loomis. Jewel McKinnon's father, Arthur Frank. Kathleen Norris's father, Harold Norris. Lonnie Nichols' father, Bud Constantine Nichols. And Marie's father, Frank Ocuzzo. Mark Rich's father, John Rich Jr. Beth Kratz and Gloria Standish's father, Daddy Dominic Salomon. Kate McDonald's father, Harvey Cypress. Lisa Seward's father, William Seward. Lynn Forrest's father, Jimmy Sanford. Inez Verhagen's father, 
Brenton Thomas Verhagen. Verhagen. Marilyn Warren's father, Ray Warren. Frank. Frank Warren. Reverend Zemke's father, Emil Zemke. And last but not least, Randy Zerman's father, Ray Zerman. Give him a hand. If there was ever a man who was generous, gracious, and good, you got it. Are you? give a special thanks to Sandy. She just stepped in this morning to fill in for Carol, who's a little under the weather today, but she stepped in, did a fabulous job. Thank you, Sandy. Yeah, all of the people who were behind the scenes to help coordinate the uh, array of fathers uh, that are represented here today. Yeah, thank thank you. you to all of those people. I know that Lonnie had a hand in it, and Carmen had a hand, and Carol had a hand, and a lot of other hands as well. So may all, they, all that work that was done uh, continue to inspire us. We all have come from somewhere, haven't we? And fathers and mothers are part of our journey. Well, today we have a gift uh, again from our brother Paul who has been with us a number of times, and he and I were exchanging a few thoughts. Uh, he was here for the anniversary that uh, marked my birthday a, a few minutes ago uh, in the springtime of the year that, you know, as older I get, the, the shorter time is. It just seems to collapse. Welcome, Paul. Good to have you back, and we're looking forward to your message of light. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, and happy Father's Day uh, to all of you fathers uh, out there. Um, I'm a father, so um, uh, I'm looking forward to doing some fun things this afternoon. I have four children. Uh, the oldest is 32. The youngest is 19 now. Um, she's a sophomore in college. My son graduated just from college two weeks ago. So I have three daughters and a son and two granddaughters. Uh, they're three and about one years old now. So um, I understand the importance of mentoring. I understand the importance of fathering. I understand the importance of being as good example as you can possibly be in this chaotic world. Um, I was fortunate to have a father that was that example for me, an earthly father. Uh, his name was Peter. Um, and there was nobody in my life that was no more important uh, because he demonstrated uh, what a kind, loving person is. And as we all know, demonstration is the highest form of teaching. Uh, we can use all kinds of words, all kinds of pretty words, uh, and give all kinds of lectures and advice and wisdom. Uh, but until we demonstrate that, it's all for naught. Uh, because your children especially, but others around you, look at you and see what you do, not what you say. Uh, and my greatest teacher was Yeshua. 
Jesus. He demonstrated. Uh, he demonstrated the light that we all are. Uh, there is a reason that he did not leave any writing in his hand. The reason for that is, is that it could be distorted. What he did leave was a demonstration that cannot be distorted. Um, and before we go much further, I would like to say um, something about Sarah Bingham. Uh, you heard her name mentioned earlier and that there is a celebration of life for her uh, next weekend and next Saturday. Sarah, uh, I had the privilege of Sarah would come in every Wednesday night to the Course in Miracles. Uh, for the last two years or so, she came in every Wednesday night and sat right next to me in the chair next to me. If someone was sitting in that chair, they had to get up and move. <laughs> she wanted to sit uh, right next to me, and what a blessing that was. Sarah spent her life, and I'm going to be very brief about this, uh, Sarah spent her life searching uh, for what she found finally in the Course in Miracles. She traveled, literally traveled the world, Nepal, Mexico, monasteries, and so forth. But she found her place, and she found what she was looking for within the light in the Course in Miracles. And she got it. She understood the truth. She asked questions. And finally, uh, probably about a week or so before she, she, her last time coming to the course, and she passed pretty quickly, she finally said to me, and I was explaining to her uh, how important it was and is to see the light of God to know that you are that light and that there is nothing else that you need to know. And she said, so all I have to do is look past what seems to be there and see the light beyond it. I said, yes. And she said, I got it. And that's the message of the Course in Miracles. That's the message of Yeshua, Jesus. That's what he came to teach. I am the light of the world. You are, and when he says I am, it's the same I am that we are. No different. The only difference between Jesus and Yeshua, which is what you would have called him, uh, if you passed him on the street. If you would have said Jesus, he would have kept walking. Uh, if you would have said Yeshua, he would have turned and looked. The only difference, he says, between you and I is that I have nothing that doesn't come from God. And in you... That right now is just a potential. And that is one of the opening paragraphs in The Course in Miracles. And I remember reading that years ago when he said, knowing, you, knowing your light is a potential in you. And I said to myself 25 years ago, literally what I said was, Game on. I said that to myself. It's no different than deciding to learn a game. If any of you have played golf or any other sport or, any, or, or anything that requires a technical skill, you decide to learn it. And if you decide to learn it, then you discipline yourself at learning it, and nothing gets in your way. So I decided to take Jesus' challenge 
and that is to become aware of nothing but the light of God. And when we take a challenge on like that, all of divinity gathers to make sure that that happens. When, when I, most of you know the story of when I came face to face with the physical Jesus sitting across from me. That's Jesus that sat across from me pretty much this far, our knees were about this far apart from each other and we sat there. When we take on the decision to take in nothing but the truth, when we take in nothing but the truth, there is no gray area. We either are in the light, we are either chosen the light that I am, or we have not. We've chosen darkness. We've chosen to be blind to the kingdom of heaven that is set out before us, and we're not seeing it. Sarah got that. She came to class after class. She read, she asked me questions, and she got it because she wanted it. She wanted it more than a drowning man wants to reach the surface of the water. That's how bad we need to want to know that I am the light of God. It's the answer to all of your questions. It's the answer to every problem that arises in the light. Because when a problem that arises in the world, when a problem arises, it typically involves fear, uncertainty, and uncertainty is fear. And this world is nothing but uncertainty. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen, go out, what's going to happen when you go to the parking lot. You don't know what's going to happen to your child when he or she goes away to college. You just don't know. And in that is uncertainty, and uncertainty is fear. Here's the only thing that you can and need to know. I am the light of God. And so when a problem or a fear presents itself to you tomorrow, or five minutes from now, and, there are, and I can see problems swirling through your minds now, all you have to do is say, stop. I am the light of God. Because the reason that it's presenting to you, Yeshua would call that Satan. He would say, get thee behind me, Satan. He was talking about any kind of fear thoughts, any kind of attack thoughts, any kinds of thoughts of misery, any thoughts about what your sickness might be or what... Uh, the doctor is going to say tomorrow, he would say, get thee behind me, Satan. I am the light of God. The importance of that, I can't, I can't understate uh, or overstate. Uh, your light, your holy light, is who and what you are. It's your real identity. It was Jesus' real identity that's why he walked through the crucifixion. He, he, the example is, is that we are giving ourselves crucifixions every day. Every day we crucify ourselves by holding anything but the light of God. And he walked through a very, very difficult crucifixion to give us the example of what it is to hold within ourselves. And afterwards, he basically came back and said, see, I am the light of God. You are the light of God. So anything that presents itself to you that is not of the light, you have the power, you have this very sacred holiness to claim the truth that I am the light of God. That's your holiness. Um, and couple quick stories, because stories demonstrate the truth of what I'm saying. Uh, when my father passed away about six years ago, um, he, had, he was in perfect health. He was 82, 84 years old. Uh, he was in perfect health. 
Um, and he was retired uh, and was walking on Bayshore Boulevard in Tampa. He got hit by a bicycle when he was taking his morning walk and fell, hit his head, and was knocked out for a nanosecond and uh, was in the hospital. They did some x-rays and so forth, and he had kind of a brain bruise. Um, that led to a slow deterioration over a number of years, two or three years, where he kind of mimics sort of Alzheimer's, not really Alzheimer's, but dementia, but he never lost the light of who he is. He smiled, he was kind, uh, he, but he couldn't relate to the world much anymore. <clears throat> and shortly before he passed, I sat with him um, and, uh, in his living room, and I just sat there silently with him, and I was guided by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit kept, kept uh, encouraging me to sit with him, and all that I kept in mind was that there is no death. Our light and our holiness is our salvation. And all that salvation means is our release from this world. Because that's what you want. You want release from this world. And it's time to pre stop pretending otherwise. It's time to stop hiding your light. And so I sat with my father, and I just kept saying silently to myself, there is no death, our holiness, and our light is our salvation. And after a couple of minutes, my father was sitting there, and his eyes were closed, and he opened his eyes, and he looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, I'm not this. And he grabbed his pant leg. He said, I'm not this. He said, I'm not Peter. His name was Peter. I'm not Peter. And so I'm sitting there. This is my father. I know his name is Peter. But he got it. I'm not Peter. I'm not the body. He got it. And so that was a teaching. That was his final teaching of me. He demonstrated. And he confirmed for me everything that Jesus says in the Course in Miracles and that I've taken to heart. That I am the light of God. You are not a body. You are a holy self. The body is an, an image that gets in the way of the light that you are. The more that you claim and know that I am the light of the world, the more peace you'll have in your life, problems will absolutely go away. Because when you claim that I am the light of the world, the world leaves you alone. You become invulnerable. That's why Jesus was able to walk through a crowd that wasn't so happy with him. And he walked right through it, came out on the other side. And the Course of Miracles promises that if you claim and know that you are the light of the world, you are completely invulnerable. And just one more quick example before I finish. Um, several years ago, probably three or four years ago, um, and, and, I, and I'm saying this because words can go in and out your ear, but stories you never forget. That's why Jesus taught in parables. That's why he, when Jesus would, they would ask him, what's the kingdom of heaven like? He would tell a story. He wouldn't define it, but he would tell a story so that you could get it in your own mind. And when I when it clicked for me, about four or five years ago, that I am the light of the world. And by the way, it's absolute humility to know that you're the light of the world. It's the height of egoism to claim that you're not, that you're something other than what God created. It's absolute humility to know and accept that you're the light of the world because that's what the truth is, and that's how our Creator created us. 
as the light and the love and the peace of the world. And so as I, this gelled for me, and in various stages along with the Course of Miracles, various things gel. When it gelled with me, I was driving through on my way home from work. I spend my days as a lawyer the last 35 years. So I take this light with me in the work that I do. It's not an, it's not an airy-fairy thing. It's not a nice thought. It's not an I wish I was the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And as I was driving home from work, I went through an old neighborhood that I used to live in when I was younger, when my kids were younger, and um, I drove down a street, um, and the house was a house that a friend of mine, his name was Peter as well, uh, that we used to have cookouts, and his kids were little, ours were little, and so forth. And um, I hadn't talked to Peter in at that, about 30 years. He had moved away to, he was in the... Um, hotel business, and he had moved away to Atlanta. He got promoted, moved to Atlanta, and I lost track of him. And, um, but I had fond memories of him, and I was driving by his house, and I was very much in, I am the light of the world. And remember, there's one light. There's one light that we share. So when I say or you say, I am the light of the world, it's not an individual thing. It's as God created us. And so, as I'm driving by his house, and I was thinking at the same time, I am the light of the world. Because when you claim that, you, this feeling comes over you, this indescribable radiance. This feeling comes over you. And as I drove past his house, I said, I wonder how Peter's doing. Just a passing thought. It was a nice memory of he and his family. And the next day, very next day, I get an email from Peter. And Peter lives in Dallas. And Peter said, are you the same Paul Cardillo that we used to have cookouts and so forth that wrote The Power of Choosing Peace? He came across my book on Amazon at the very same time that I saw him and thought of him in the light, because there's one light. And uh, he, there was, he told me some things about his life, and I wrote back and said yes. And we had a, a, just a conversation on email. And he said, as I got, I've gotten older, I've become more spiritual. And it was nice to see a demonstration of when you claim that you are, that I am the light of God. Everyone that's ever been in your life, everyone that will ever be in your life, is in the light. What is really here now is the kingdom of heaven. That's all that is real, that is here, is the light, the kingdom of heaven. And... Peter, that little story about Peter, who now is, and I won't name the, the hotel, but he is the CEO of the world's largest hotel chain, luxury hotel chain in the world. Um, and that is the demonstration of that there is no separation. In the light, there is no separation. So let me leave it with this that as you claim and know, and even beyond that, as you know that you are the light of God, as you know that, and some of you will probably walk away from here today saying, how in the world can I claim or know that? Because it's the only thing in you that's true. It's the only creation of God is the light that you are. And in that light, the light isn't static. It's, it's ecstasy. It's peace. It's absolute joy. It's absolute happiness. It's eternal happiness. Can you imagine what it would be like to spend an hour in complete happiness? Nothing comes to disturb your peace. Can you imagine what it would be like to do that for two hours? How about three hours? 
How about a day? Most of us can imagine it for a short period of time. Now know, know this, that in the light that you are, and again, Yeshua is very present, and he would tell you to stop pretending. It's really time to stop pretending that you're not the light of God. He says that we go to great lengths to hide our holiness. We go to great lengths to hide our light. It's that, and you've heard the Bible verse that, you know, why would you put a candle under a bushel? That's what he's saying that we do. We, play, we light a candle and then we place a bushel over it. You are the light of God. And that's the answer to anything that arises tomorrow. Trust me on this. If you put this into practice, you, it will blow you away. I do it constantly. When there's a situation, like, I, like I've had judges that were absolute crabs turn into absolute lovely people. They change, people change their personality because there's one light. The light of God is my will. I will, you have the power to will light. The light of God is my will. You have that power, and it's just a very soft voice within yourself. You have this light in you. And here, here's where I really, I really will stop. I could go on and on. Um, um, there is this, there, you have the light of God in you. And think of it this way. And Jesus says in the Course in Miracles, you'll never be released from this world if you don't release your light. Because what we did is we took it and we condensed it and made it kind of like a golf ball. And it's all wound up in there. And we spend our lives in conflict. We spend our lives defending from the fears of the world. What he asks us to do is just imagine yourself allowing that light to release. Just release your inner light. It's just a thought. It's just a gentle notion. I release my inner light. And just trust me on this. When you put this into practice, I am the light of God. When something disturbs your peace, I am the light of God. And don't let that go because that's who you are. Thank you.